St. Athanasius of Alexandria, a church father who lived from 298 to 373 CE, articulated the view that any system that deliberately and categorically denies, dismisses, or attacks Logos and its manifestation in the world will end up being satanic. In a satanic universe, what is considered true becomes a falsehood, and conversely, what is deemed false is, by definition, considered true. Friedrich Nietzsche, who progressively adopted a satanic philosophy in metaphysical terms by proposing the transvaluation of all values, articulated this concept succinctly. To be truthful means using the customary metaphor, in moral terms, the obligation to lie according to a fixed convention, to lie herd-like in a style obligatory for all. In essence, a deliberate or metaphysical opposition to Logos constitutes a warfare against practical reason and the political order, culminating in an active allegiance to Satan. E. Michael Jones in Dionysus Rising suggests that Nietzsche intentionally infected himself with syphilis as a form of a demonic pact. Historians and writers such as Robert Payne, Paul Johnson, Richard Wormbrand, and more recently Paul Kengor, posit that figures like Karl Marx entered into similar pacts with the devil. Armand M. Nicoli, a Harvard scholar, contends that Sigmund Freud shared a fascination with Faustian pacts with the devil. Reason, thought, logic, order, and harmony in the universe can all be extensions of Logos. Logos, as one source declares, is the appeal to reason that relies on logic or reason, inductive and deductive reasoning. The Gospel of John associates Logos with Christ. It states, In the beginning was Logos, and Logos was with God, and Logos was God. The entire cosmos, which encompasses order and beauty, is under the guiding hand of Logos, who shares the very same essence as God. Heraclitus, the pre-Socratic Greek philosopher, makes several references to an ultimate truth or real existence, a logos who determines the course of all that comes to pass. The concept of logos and its application has been present since ancient times, notably in ancient Greek philosophy. Indeed, Greek philosophy is inseparable from logos, one example is Heraclitus, who attributed Logos to a person, the wise thing, separate from the material world and the sustainer of all existence. Heraclitus posited that this Logos serves as the ruling principle of nature and is universally shared among humanity, though individuals often fail to grasp it due to their moral and intellectual limitations. The early church apologists widely recognized that Christ, identified as the Logos, embodies the essence of existence and the rationale for the rational order in the universe. This understanding was a key factor behind St. Paul's declaration on Mars Hill when confronted by the Stoics. For in Logos we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring." In essence, humans are considered the offspring of Logos, endowed with the capacity to comprehend reason, logic, and order. Greek philosophy and Christianity share a symbiotic relationship as both fundamentally appeal to Logos, fostering constructive dialogue between them. Aristotle, for example, called Logos reasoned discourse. Historian and classicist Paul Anthony Rahay writes that for Aristotle, Human beings are set apart from other animals not by their capacity for self-expression, but rather by their capacity for rational discourse. According to Aristotle, the presence of Logos is crucial for the formation of a cohesive community or even a nation. Logos, in Aristotle's view, enables individuals to distinguish between what is good and evil, just and unjust. As per Rahe's interpretation of Aristotle, anyone who challenges this essential aspect is destined to find themselves at war with the world. If the Gospel of John is accurate in asserting that Christ is the incarnate Logos, it follows that the same Gospel also asserts that any worldview intentionally and metaphysically opposing Christ will ultimately align with the satanic. 
This explains why Christ, as stated in John chapter 8, declares to the Pharisees that their father is Satan. St. John reiterates this perspective in the book of Revelation, stating, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. This leads us to a central point. The antithesis of Logos is Satanism. Satanism represents a world where practical reason in the political order is intentionally rejected and disregarded for ideological ends. In Nietzschean terms, Satanism embodies the transvaluation of all values, the overthrow of what Immanuel Kant terms the categorical imperativity and anything rationale. If reason, truth, harmony, and order are aligned with logos, then deliberate lies, deception, and irrationality are associated with Satanism. Manifestations of Satanism or anti-Logos ideologies are evident in various aspects of contemporary society. Saul Alinsky stands as a classic example of an individual openly pledging allegiance to Satan as the ultimate radical. Alinsky states at the beginning of his book, Rules for Radicals, lest we forget at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical. From all our legends, mythology and history, and who is to know where mythology leaves off and history begins, or which is which, the first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom, Lucifer. As an active agent of Satan, Alinsky incorporates manipulation into his revolutionary movement. Alinsky again declared, Ridicule is man's most potent weapon. It is almost impossible to counterattack ridicule. Also, it infuriates the opposition, who then react to your advantage. This contradicts practical reason, which dictates that arguments should be based on logic and implies the necessity of engaging with the opposition's arguments rather than resorting to ridicule. Alinsky also recognized that if you cannot refute specific arguments, attacking the person's character becomes a strategy. If the individual reacts defensively, you have gained an advantage. Alinsky asserted that by distracting your opponent from their main point, you increase the chances of undermining their arguments. If someone attempts to distract you with nonsensical arguments or disparaging remarks about your character, it's advised to ignore them. Following the proverbial wisdom, do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you're going to be just like him. Remember that in 2014, George Soros, through his Open Society Foundation, published Alinsky's Rules for Radicals in locations like the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. The neoconservative movement serves as another notable example of Satanism in practice. To sustain the neoconservative ideology, falsehoods were propagated, innocent lives were lost, the average American was misled, and a seemingly purposeless war on Islam and Muslim countries unfolded under the deceptive banner of the War on Terror, resulting in a staggering $6 trillion cost. For a closer examination of Satanism in action, one can consider figures like Daniel Pipes, a neoconservative who played a prominent role in perpetuating the conflict in Syria. Pipes controversially and cunningly asserted in 2013 that the United States and much of the West should simultaneously support both the Syrian terrorists and the Assad government. Expressing this viewpoint, Pipes stated, the West should prevent either side in the civil war from emerging victorious by helping whichever side is losing so as to prolong their conflict. Pipes was aware that this approach was morally and politically diabolical. He recognized that it contradicted the principles of the moral and political order. Understanding that an extended conflict in the region would result in increased bloodshed, misery, and destruction, he was cognizant that perpetual wars would generate enduring animosity, particularly toward the countries that initiated the conflicts namely Israel and the United States, as perceived by critics. Instead of advocating for a peaceful resolution, Pipes seemed to endorse a scenario of massive casualties. 
His stance appeared to condone heinous acts, with a disturbing imagery of Syrian terrorists committing brutal atrocities in front of cheering crowds. Furthermore, Pipes seemed to acknowledge the unorthodox nature of his suggestion, stating, This policy recommendation of helping whichever side is losing sounds odd, I admit, but it is strategic. This aligns with the neoconservative ideology, which is characterized by a political orientation that some perceive as satanic. Jewish writer Sidney Blumenthal has posited that the neoconservative movement derives its political and intellectual ideology from the Disputatus Heretic of the Talmud. In essence, the neoconservative ideology is portrayed as neither rational nor reasonable, but rather Talmudic. This highlights a crucial point. Pipes and those who share his ideological stance appear to be in conflict with metaphysical logos. They fervently pursued their malevolent agenda, making concerted efforts to manipulate circumstances. Their actions involved sowing discord among decent populations, aiming to establish what some may perceive as a satanic dominion on earth. Their loyalty in America transcends conventional political labels of liberal or conservative, as evidenced by their manipulation of both the Republican and Democratic parties. Their ultimate allegiance lies with Israel. Can these individuals be halted? As we will illustrate, the answer is affirmative. In February 14th of 2022, the Wall Street Journal admitted that the war in Syria has been a strategic success for Vladimir Putin. In a similar vein, Chris Miller of Tufts University declared that Putin has gotten what he wants in Syria. Implicit in the remarks of both the Wall Street Journal and Miller is the suggestion that Vladimir Putin played a role in putting an end to political Satanism in Syria. Let's delve into the reason why Vladimir Putin specifically opposed political Satanism, especially in Syria. In 2007, Putin characterized the war in Iraq, led by neoconservatives in America, as pointless. This conflict resulted in the destruction of innocent lives and livelihoods. Echoing these sentiments, Israeli writer Ari Shavit, in an article titled The White Man's Burden, in April 2003, noted, The war in Iraq was conceived by 25 neoconservative intellectuals, most of them Jewish, who were urging President Bush to alter the course of history. Who were those people? Here are their names. Richard Pearl, commonly known as Prince of Darkness, Paul Wolfowitz, Douglas Feith, Michael Ledeen, Scooter Libby, Charles Krauthammer, Stephen Bryan, David Frum, Robert Kagan, David Wormser, Dov Zakheim, Henry Kissinger, Norman Podhoretz, John Podhoretz, Elliot Abrams, Frederick Kagan, Donald Kagan, Alan Dershowitz, Daniel Pipes, Elliot Cohen, Bill Crystal, Irving Crystal, a former Trotskyite, Max Boot, James Schlesinger, Mark Grossman, and Joshua Bolton, all of whom had political power in one way or another during the Bush administration. These individuals garnered a multitude of neocon supporters and followers both in England and America. Figures such as Tony Blair, George W. Bush, John Bolton, John McCain, Lindsey Graham, Ann Coulter, Thomas Sowell, and others proved to be effective advocates for the neoconservative ideology. After the Iraq War proved to be a profound failure, Neoconservatives such as Jonah Goldberg asserted in the Los Angeles Times in 2006 that the Iraq War was a worthy mistake. Goldberg expressed a similar sentiment elsewhere, stating, Every 10 years or so, the United States needs to pick up some small, crappy little country and throw it against the wall, just to show the world we mean business. According to Goldberg, pursuing perpetual wars in the Middle East rather than seeking peaceful resolutions and engaging in fruitful dialogue, is the path to progress. There is nothing we want to see happen in the Middle East that can be accomplished through talking around long tables festooned with bottled water and fresh fruit at Swiss hotels. He wrote, That cannot be accomplished faster and more permanently through war. 
but there is plenty that cannot be achieved by such gab-fests that can only be achieved through war. In that regard, Goldberg can be seen as subscribing to a political satanic ideology, and here is how he articulated it. Wouldn't an invasion of Iraq result in instability in the region? Yes, but in this context, instability is more likely to be good than bad. The logic is quite evident. Goldberg desired to witness bloodshed across the Middle East, particularly in Iraq. Fulfilling what can be deemed an essentially satanic dream took precedence over the lives of Iraqi civilians. According to Goldberg and the neoconservative worldview, these individuals are not mere civilians. They are seen as needing to be liberated. To underscore this perspective, one can consider Michael Ledane himself, who authored an article entitled Creative Destruction. Ledane, who resided at the neoconservative think tank, the American Enterprise Institute, declared that creative destruction is our middle name. We tear down the old order every day, from business to science, literature, art, architecture and cinema, to politics and the law. The term old order in this context refers to the moral and political order, which is constructed through practical reason. From Socrates and Plato to Aristotle, and extending all the way to Immanuel Kant and Friedrich Hegel, the universe has consistently been perceived as logocentric, signifying the existence of a metaphysical. Order underlying reality. E. Michael Jones aptly notes in his book, Logos Rising, that Hegel's philosophy does have its challenges. Nevertheless, Hegel ultimately believed that this universe is guided by divine providence, which initiated the world with a predetermined purpose. Hegel argued that this world is not prey to chance and external contingent causes, but is governed by providence. He moves on to say that the world's events are controlled by a providence, indeed by divine providence, and this divine providence is wisdom, coupled with infinite power, which realizes its ends, i.e., the absolute and rational design of the world. Summarizing Hegel's point, scholar Robert C. Tucker writes that according to Hegel, history fulfills its ulterior rational designs in an indirect and sly manner. It does so by calling into play the irrational element in human nature, the passions. Hegel wrote, that world history is governed by an ultimate design, that it is a rational process, whose rationality is not that of a particular subject, but a divine and absolute reason. This is a proposition whose truth we must assume. Its proof lies in the study of world history itself, which is the image and enactment of reason. A contemporary embodiment of Hegel's concept, the cunning of reason, can be identified in J.R.R. Tolkien's The Fellowship of the Ring. Tolkien indirectly alludes to this divine and absolute reason that governs global affairs and manifests itself in the unfolding of history and world events. When Frodo comprehends that Middle-earth is engaged in an everlasting and cosmic struggle against an adversary intent on witnessing the extinction of the human race, he laments, I wish it need not have happened in my time. Gandalf, displaying wisdom surpassing that of the young Frodo, responds, So do I, and so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. Frodo, initially an obscure young boy, unexpectedly played a pivotal role in defeating Sauron, the antagonist in Middle-earth. Frodo had not envisioned a significant role for himself. Hegel would likely characterize this as the cunning of reason. In essence, the universe operates under the governance of reason and order, evident in various disciplines such as mathematics, physics, biology, history, literature, anatomy, astronomy, and more. As humans, our responsibility is to align our lives with this inherent order. Unlike the approach of Karl Marx, who advocated embracing satanic madness to combat an irrational system, 
our path lies in following the light of reason. Through docility to the truth, we can overcome satanic powers and human wickedness. However, those who have pledged allegiance to Satanism are resistant to adhering to this order, as it would hinder their pursuit of dismantling one country after another. The same neoconservative chorus also sought the removal of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Why? Israel had a vested interest in ousting Assad, as declared by the Jerusalem Post in 2013. Israel wanted Assad gone since the start of the war in Syria. However, the neocon agenda encountered a formidable obstacle during the Obama administration, that unyielding obstacle being Russia. Vladimir Putin personally guaranteed Bashar al-Assad that Russia would prevent the Syrian government from losing the civil war. It is undeniable that Russia has progressively emerged as a formidable force. This reality led the late U.S. Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, to acknowledge that Russia and China are challenging the world order. It is evident that Israel sought the removal of Assad from the outset of the war, and there is acknowledgement that Israel preferred groups like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, or Al-Nusra over the Assad government. As the Israeli ambassador Michael Oren said in 2013, the initial message about the Syrian issue was that we always wanted President Bashar Assad to go. We always preferred the bad guys who weren't backed by Iran to the bad guys who were backed by Iran. Oren again agreed that the Syrian rebels ISIS and al-Nusra are pretty bad guys. Still, the greatest danger to Israel is by the strategic arc that extends from Tehran to Damascus to Beirut. And we saw the Assad regime as the keystone in that arc. That is a position we had well before the outbreak of hostilities in Syria. With the outbreak of hostilities, we continued to want Assad to go. What likely unsettled Satanists in the United States was Putin's explicit statement that Russia had the strength to resist Satanism in the political sphere. Putin said, Russia, thank God, isn't Iraq. It has enough strength and power to defend itself and its interests, both on its territory and in other parts of the world. Putin's assessment of the war in Iraq is accurate. Notably, esteemed scholars such as Andrew J. Bakovich, a retired career officer in the armor branch of the United States Army and an academic, have emphasized that the war was an unmitigated disaster. In his 2013 book, Breach of Trust, How Americans Failed Their Soldiers and Their Country, Bechevich declared, apart from a handful of deluded neoconservatives, no one believes that the United States accomplished its objectives in Iraq, unless the main objective was to commit mayhem, apply a tourniquet to staunch the bleeding, and then declare the patient stable while hastily leaving the scene of the crime. The fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq has exacted a huge price from the U.S. military, especially the Army and the Marines. More than 6,700 soldiers have been killed so far in those two conflicts, and over 50,000 have been wounded in action, about 22% with traumatic brain injuries. Furthermore, as always happens in war, many of the combatants are psychological casualties as they return home with post-traumatic stress disorder PTSD or depression. The Department of Veterans Affairs reported in the fall of 2012 that more than 247,000 veterans of the Afghanistan and Iraq wars have been diagnosed with PTSD. Many of those soldiers have served multiple combat tours. It is hardly surprising that the suicide rate in the U.S. military increased by 80% from 2002 to 2009, while the civilian rate increased only 15%. And in 2009, veterans of Iraq were twice as likely to be unemployed as the typical American. On top of all that, returning war veterans are roughly four times more likely to face family-related problems like divorce, domestic violence and child abuse than those who stayed out of harm's way. In 2007, the year the Iraq War ended, one out of every five active duty soldiers was on antidepressants, sedatives, or other prescription drugs. 
The incidence of spousal abuses piqued, as did the divorce rate among military couples. Debilitating combat stress reached epidemic proportions. So did brain injuries. Soldier suicide skyrocketed. If you think that Basevich is woefully mistaken, then consider this. From 2003 to 2012, over 2,000 doctors and nurses and over 400 academics have been assassinated in Iraq. Others have emigrated due to violence in the region. In 1990, there were about 30,000 registered doctors in Iraq. By 2008, more than 15,000 doctors had already left the country. Then there was the high unemployment that ravaged sections of the region, combining with the fact that educational institutions were in decline. The satanic agenda imposed by the neoconservatives in Iraq also took a toll on Christian families and neighborhoods in the Middle East. Doug Bando courageously stated in 2010 that the historic Christian community has been largely destroyed in Iraq after the war, witnessing the deaths and forced exile of hundreds of Christians to countries like Syria and Lebanon. Similar patterns unfolded in Syria, where the Christian minority became a target of the so-called Syrian rebels or terrorists. By October 2012, it became evident that supporting the rebels meant endorsing hardline Islamic jihadis, as noted by David Sanger of the New York Times. The rebels themselves were known to support senseless destruction, criminal behavior, and the cold-blooded killing of prisoners. We all know by now that torture was routine in Abu Ghraib, and forcing prisoners to have sex with one another and sodomizing teenagers were fair game. One prisoner testified that he saw one officer. Fucking a kid, his age would be about 15, 18 years. The kid was hurting very bad and they covered all the doors with sheets. Then when I heard the screaming, I climbed the door because on top it wasn't covered. And I saw, name black it out, who was wearing the military uniform putting his dick in the little kid's ass. I couldn't see the face of the kid because his face wasn't in front of the door and the female soldier was taking pictures. What's more, even interesting... 150 inmates were crammed into cells designed for 24. Abu Ghraib, as one writer put it, was a hellhole. Torture was also routine in Afghanistan, where adolescents were beaten with hoses and pipes and threats of sodomy. These acts were not done in the dark. Cambridge University published similar reports in a book that is more than 1,200 pages long. These acts were also testified to by psychiatrists, such as Terry Coopers. The estimate of lives lost in the war in Iraq alone is between 100,000 to 600,000, including thousands of civilians. In 2003, at least 12,000 civilians lost their lives. The first three years of the war produced between 104,000 and 223,000 civilian deaths. When it was over, 2.3 million Iraqis had been forced to flee their homes and towns. By 2008, another 2.7 million Iraqis were displaced, and nearly half a million civilians ended up losing their lives. Thousands upon thousands of other people went missing by 2008. This is out of a total Iraqi population of about 30 million people. In the aftermath of the Iraq War, Sectarian violence and car bombings became rampant, occurring almost daily. Journalist Mark Kukis, reporting on the aftermath in Iraq, recounted hearing two to five car bombs every day. According to Kukis, the Iraq war shook the entire nation and created havoc, particularly evident by 2006. Societal factions that had once coexisted were dismantled. In summary, Iraq experienced exponential decay, with buildings and farmlands left in ruins. The war's collateral damage included between 300,000 and 360,000 American, veterans returning home with untreated brain injuries. In 2005, over 6,000 suicides occurred among soldiers serving in Iraq. By 2012, the number of soldier suicides surpassed those who died in combat marking it as the year with the highest suicide rate since 2001. 
The Iraq War left American taxpayers with a staggering bill of $6 trillion, coupled with a continually rising debt ceiling every six months. By the end of 2012, the U.S. national debt had reached $16 trillion. The strain on the economy contributed to a significant increase in suicides among America's civilian population during that period. Homelessness among Iraq and Afghanistan veterans more than doubled, with reports in the fall of 2012 indicating that at least 26,131 were living on the streets, at risk of losing their homes, staying in temporary housing, or receiving federal vouchers to pay rent. Additionally, around 307,000 soldiers expressed a desire to leave the military. Approximately 360,000 Iraq and Afghanistan veterans are grappling with injuries, many of which are severe. Following the conclusion of the war in Iraq, Iraqi women found themselves drawn into prostitution. As highlighted by the news site Common Dreams in 2007, U.S. military deployments in the Gulf War, the Afghan War, and the Iraq War have reinvigorated prostitution and the trafficking of women in the Middle East. The article is author continued to declare, The U.S. invasion of March 2003 brought prostitution back to Iraq within a matter of weeks. The Iraq War has now lasted eight times longer than the Gulf War deployments and is marked by a huge reliance on private security contractors. A U.S. ban on human trafficking, signed by President Bush in January 2006, has not been applied to these contractors. The rebirth of prostitution has generated fear that permeates all of Iraqi society. Families keep their girls inside, not only to keep them from being assaulted or killed, but to prevent them from being kidnapped by organized prostitution rings. Gangs are also forcing some families to sell their children into sex slavery. The war has created an enormous number of homeless girls and boys who are most vulnerable to the sex trade. It has also created thousands of refugee women who try to escape danger but end up, out of economic desperation, being prostituted in Jordan, Syria, Yemen, or the UAE. Our occupation not only attacks women on the outside, but attacks them on the inside until there is nothing left to destroy. On leave from Iraq in 2005, Army reservist Patrick Lackett said that, for one dollar you can get a prostitute for one hour. The noted journalist Rajiv Chandrasekharan declared that before the Iraq war, there were prostitutes in Baghdad, but you couldn't drive into a town to get laid like in Saigon. In other words, the invasion of Iraq brought a flood of prostitution activities in the country. Since thousands upon thousands of Iraqis suffered after the war, many of them began to abandon their children and even sold them to sex slavery. One 16-year-old girl by the name of Nada, who got caught in this dilemma, told BBC News in 2007, I have no one there and in my case, and I am afraid for my life. My family has abandoned me. The girl was forced into the sex business in Syria after her father dumped her at the border and was facing deportation when the story aired. Nathir women who found themselves in a similar dilemma included former nurses, sales clerks, students, and more. Once the war concluded, it marked the end of their economic livelihoods. A 34-year-old whose home was Bomet and who lost her mother during the same event lamented, I have no home anymore, no family, no piece of land. The report declared of her, She was shot twice while working for the U.S. military in the Green Zone. When she fled to Jordan penniless and couldn't find a job, she turned to prostitution. Other stories are simply heartbreaking. An Iraqi interviewed by the Associated Press in July said she doused herself and her 14-year-old daughter in gasoline in an attempt to end it all after she gave a smuggler her life savings, $18,000, to take them over the border from Turkey to Greece. The smuggler vanished. She said she would have killed herself rather than sell her body, which seemed her only option. But her daughter's tearful pleas prevented her from lightening the match. She was in my arms, soaked with gasoline and shivering from fright, she said. I was so desperate and there was no way out. 
Carol Lelev, who worked for UNHCR in Damascus, declared, The situation is getting out of hand. We see a lot of women who haven't necessarily become prostitutes, but they were kidnapped, raped repeatedly, and they are in Syria all alone. That's quite clear. We did a survey of trauma, and we found incredible rates of post-traumatic stress disorder among children, among women, and the population in general. Yanar Mohammed, founder of Women's Freedom in Iraq, added, In Syria, we hear that some women reach the point where they are begging strangers passing by to exploit them sexually so they can feed their children. You know, women of Iraq were not in this situation, I would say, six years ago. We did not have to do this. We did not have to go through humiliation, through prostitution. Other parents who could not cope with the post-war situation sold their children to countries as far away as India, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia. The same sex business was still vivid in 2009 in the same regions. Yanar Mohammed said that many of the traffickers have very good ties with the police. It turns out the cops were loyal customers. The girls in those places were as young as 11 and 12, and once a girl reached 20 years old, she was considered too old. The sex business once again cropped up in 2010 and 2011. Fast forward to 2013, Iraq was still facing trouble with the sex trafficking business. The brothels in some of those regions have been established purely to meet the demand created by United States service personnel. While sexual exploitation existed in Iraq, as anywhere, Long before the war began in 2003, the invasion and instability that followed led to an environment where young women and girls became much more vulnerable to trafficking, one study found out. Arab society traditionally values female virginity, but the Israeli war forced them into sexual slavery. Just seven years after the war, about 4,000 women, one-fifth of them aged under 18, disappeared. A tour married her 19-year-old sweetheart, a policeman called Bilal, when she was 15. Three months later, he was dead, killed during one of the many bloody episodes in Iraq's brutal war. After the obligatory four-month mourning period dictated by Islamic Sharia law, a tour's mother and two brothers made it clear that they intended to sell her to a brothel close to their home in western Baghdad, just as they had sold her older twin sisters. Frightened, she confided in a friend in the police force and asked him to raid her home and the nearby brothel. His unit executed the operation, and as a result, a tour spent the next two years in prison. Although she was not charged with anything, it took that long for her to finally appear before a judge and be released. She said, I wanted to go to prison. I didn't want to be sold. I didn't think it would happen to me. My mother used to spoil me. Yes, she sold my sisters but she regretted that. I thought that she loved me. The British newspaper The Independent claims that the women who were forced into prostitution are about 50,000 Iraqi refugee women in Syria. It is said that, after the American invasion of Iraq in 2003, private contracting companies used foreign prostitutes smuggled into bases and the international zone of Baghdad as bribery for other contracts. Other places like Kurdistan region, women and children trafficked from the rest of Iraq for prostitution. Kirkuk, which is a city in Iraq, was flooded with brothels and prostitution. The perpetual wars also produce a form of sexual calculus in the American military, the likes of which we have never seen before. The Washington Post reported that three rapes occur every hour in the military now, an issue persisting since 2003, the year the Iraq War began. In another expose, the Washington Post revealed that an Air Force recruiter is facing charges for forcibly performing sodomy on 18 young women, whom he had tried to recruit, over a three-year period. Individuals responsible for programs aimed at preventing sexual harassment were arrested for their involvement in such misconduct. Additionally, on at least one military base, an army sergeant ran a prostitution ring and coerced others into prostitution. The identified sergeant was later revealed to be Sergeant First Class 
Gregory McQueen. An estimated 26,000 people were sexually assaulted in 2012, with 19,000 reported cases in 2010. These figures may be even higher, as many victims choose not to report their assaults. Furthermore, upon returning home, thousands of women confronted the horror of grappling with guilt, leading some to spiral into a life of drugs and homelessness. Despite excelling in the army, the transition home was not always pleasant, given the scarcity of job opportunities. At the age of 26, Jennifer Cortez, an army sergeant, demonstrated outstanding service and earned 12 medals over eight years. However, upon returning home, she was only offered a minimum wage job, sweeping floors. Despite her achievements, Cortez found herself living in her car. Alarmingly, at least 53% of those who had experienced sexual assault were homeless upon returning home. Furthermore, when these individuals could no longer work, they faced the additional hardship of having their pension funds looted by what the New York Times aptly describes as predators. Moreover, individuals disabled due to the war are encountering significant challenges in obtaining their disability benefits, with at least 600,000 cases reported in spring 2013. Essentially, those who dedicated themselves to the military and faced sexual abuse found themselves ensnared in a system that provided them little opportunity, often likened to a Zionist or Israeli matrix. The late scholar Judith A. Reisman and writer Thomas R. Hampson documented that 5,200 employees introduced pornography into the U.S. military. Despite the numerous challenges and negative outcomes, a group of neocons, including individuals such as Victor Davis Hansen and Thomas Sowell from the Hoover Institution, displayed audacity by writing a series of books praising the Iraq War following the debacle. In Hansen's book, The Savior Generals, for instance, he dedicates an entire chapter applauding the Iraq War despite its devastating impact on the region in 2003. In an attempt to salvage both himself and the neoconservative movement from intellectual and political oblivion, Hanson compares the Iraq War to historical conflicts in 1777, 1941, and 1950, asserting that they led to massive American casualties and, for a time, public despair. At no point did Hansen address the undeniable reality that the Iraq War was initiated based on a substantial falsehood. He never countered the explicit warnings from the U.S. intelligence community to the Bush administration, stating there was insufficient evidence supporting Saddam's possession of weapons of mass destruction, WMDs. The fact that Bush instructed his associates to manipulate evidence, perpetuating the categorical lie that Saddam had WMDs, was never acknowledged by Hansen. There was a notable absence of engagement with scholarly evidence on this matter. Furthermore, he failed to discuss the disturbing incidents of sodomy and torture at Abu Ghraib. Hansen made no mention, even in passing, that before the Iraq War, practices like waterboarding were unfamiliar in America. Additionally, there was no acknowledgement that George Washington had repudiated the use of torture. As the Iraq War unfolded into a chaotic situation, Hansen and Seoul, who had initially supported the war, found themselves compelled to construct impressively incoherent and irresponsibly reductionist arguments. These arguments aimed to simultaneously sustain their neoconservative stance and justify their lucrative roles as neocons with ties to the State of Israel. In his book, Intellectuals and Society, Sowell suggests that the Iraq War was more like most wars, with unforeseen setbacks and unpredictable side effects, quite aside from debatable issues about the wisdom of the invasion or the nature of its goals. However, this perspective neglects the overwhelming evidence that the war was founded on a lie from its inception to its conclusion, a point emphasized by numerous scholars that Sowell and others choose to dismiss deliberately. In a paradoxical twist, Sowell maintains in the same book that the surge in Iraq was effective, 
refusing to acknowledge the glaring issues even when confronted with substantial evidence. This stance is particularly ironic given his penchant for demanding evidence. Victor Davis Hansen is no exception. He described how he became a neocon this way. I came to support neocon approaches first in the wars against the Taliban and Saddam, largely because I saw little alternative in a post 9-11 effort to stop radical Islam and state sponsors of terror, to removing such odious enemies and did not think leaving. The defeated in power, as in 1991, or leaving in defeat, as in Lebanon, or installing a post-bellum strongman was viable or in U.S. interests. Hansen's inclination toward deliberate falsehoods becomes evident when considering the Iraq War. It was never about presenting an alternative to the neocon ideology because, fundamentally, the neocons were aware that Saddam Hussein had no weapons of mass destruction, saw WMDs. This awareness is exemplified by instances such as Deputy National Security Advisor Stephen Hadley informing Paul Wolfowitz that there was no connection between Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein. In response, Wolfowitz asserted with certainty, We'll find it. It's got to be there, essentially indicating a willingness to fabricate evidence if none existed. It can be asserted with confidence that Putin's observation about perpetual wars in the Middle East holds merit. The mass media's denigration of him may have stemmed from discomfort caused by his refusal to become a puppet of what he deemed a diabolical regime. The late scholar Stefan F. Cohen, in his book War with Russia, aptly noted that vilifying Russia's leader has become a canon in the orthodox U.S. narrative of the new Cold War. Initially, between 1999 and 2000, much of the Western media, including the New York Times, welcomed Putin with open arms. However, once it became clear that Putin was not willing to be manipulated, they swiftly recanted their praise. Cohen highlighted this shift, stating, In 2004, Times columnist Nicholas Kristof inadvertently explained why, at least partially. Kristof complained bitterly of having been suckered by Mr. Putin. He is not a sober version of Boris Yeltsin. By 2006, a Wall Street Journal editor, reflecting the establishment's revised opinion, declared it, Time we start thinking of Vladimir Putin's Russia as an enemy of the United States. They were correct, as Putin is known for his opposition to the United States engaging in the destruction of one country after another. He notably observed the disastrous consequences of the U.S. intervention in Libya in 2011, when Muammar Gaddafi was overthrown during the Obama administration. Putin, in 2011, commented on the unfolding destruction of Libya, expressing his concerns about the actions of the United States. Who permitted this? Was there any trial? Who took on the right to execute this man, no matter who he is? The country's whole infrastructure is being destroyed. And in essence, one of the warring sides is attacking under the cover of aircraft. When the entire so-called civilized community falls upon a small country with all its might, destroys infrastructure created over generations, I don't know, is that good or not? I don't like it. Is there a lack of crooked regimes in the world? What are we going to intervene in? Internal conflicts everywhere? Look at Africa. What's been happening in Somalia for many years? Are we going to bomb everywhere and conduct missile strikes? Putin vividly characterized the televised images of Gaddafi's final moments as horrible, disgusting scenes. Criticizing the events, Putin questioned the essence of democracy, asking, who did this? He described a scenario where drones, including those of the U.S., targeted Gaddafi's motorcade. Subsequently, unauthorized commandos, in contact with the so-called opposition and militants through radio communication, led to Gaddafi's killing without proper investigation or trial. Putin asserted that a U.S. drone, in conjunction with other NATO planes, was responsible for firing on the convoy. Evidently, entities like NATO, the United States, and other New World Order organizations were displeased with Putin's assessment of the situation in the Middle East, 
even though Putin was right. In fact, when Gaddafi was removed from power, even The Guardian admitted that Libya became a terrorist safe haven. Particularly notable was Putin's response when the New World Order sought to destabilize another Middle Eastern country, Syria. In this instance, Putin took measures to ensure that those instigating conflict faced the repercussions of their own actions. He successfully intervened to halt terrorist cells in the region, despite the fact that these cells were allegedly supported by both the United States and Israel, according to the satanic ideology. An alarming incident highlighted the brutality of these terrorist groups, where one individual on camera gruesomely cut the heart out of a dead body, took a bite, and declared, I swear to God we will eat your hearts and your livers, you soldiers of Bashar the dog. In response, Putin challenged the West, questioning the wisdom of supplying weapons to such barbaric individuals. He stated, These are people who don't just kill their enemies. They open up their bodies and eat their intestines in front of the public and the cameras. Are these the people you want to support with weapons? The Satanists concocted a barrage of falsehoods to vilify both Putin and Assad. Fabrications, such as the claim that Assad was gassing his own people, were entirely fabricated by those seeking to sow chaos in Syria. The diabolical regime went further, asserting that Assad, with the assistance of Russia, was responsible for killing civilians in Syria. This notion lacks logic, as evidenced by the Associated Press declaring in 2014 that Syria's Assad wins presidential vote in landslide with an overwhelming 88.7% support. It would be nonsensical for Assad to harm the very civilians who democratically elected him to power. The absurdity of this idea raises questions about the credibility of the diabolical regime's narrative. In summary, Syria, aided by Russia and Iran, emerged victorious. Regarding the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, a concise and fairly accurate report on why Russia decided to intervene can be found in Benjamin Abelow's book, How the West Brought War to Ukraine. Understanding how U.S. and NATO policies led to crisis, war, and the risk of nuclear catastrophe. Abelow, a historian and medical doctor, provides sources that are highly accessible to scholars and journalists. In the past, we've contended that Russia aligns with rational thought concerning Ukraine, and Abelo indirectly supports this perspective. For instance, he makes a noteworthy declaration on the Monroe Doctrine. Any foreign power that places military forces near U.S. territory knows it is crossing a red line. U.S. policy thus embodies a conviction that where a potential opponent places its forces is crucially important. In fact, this conviction is the cornerstone of American foreign and military policy, and its violation is considered reason for war. Yet when it comes to Russia, the United States and its NATO allies have acted for decades in disregard of this same principle. Abelo argues that Russia is following the same line of thinking. Abelo gives one example after another, proving or showing that. The underlying cause of the war lies not in an unbridled expansionism of Mr. Putin or in paranoid delusions of military planners in the Kremlin, but in a 30-year history of Western provocations directed at Russia that began during the dissolution of the Soviet Union and continued to the start of the war. These provocations placed Russia in an untenable situation for which war seemed to Mr. Putin and his military staff, the only workable solution. Expanded NATO over a thousand miles eastward, pressing it toward Russia's borders in disregard of assurances previously given to Moscow. Russian officials have expressed a conviction that their engagement in Ukraine is a battle against Satanism. Former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev explicitly stated that Russia's war in Ukraine is considered a sacred conflict against Satan. Medvedev declared that Russia's mission in Ukraine is to stop the supreme ruler of hell, whatever name he uses, Satan, Lucifer, or Iblis. Regardless of one's agreement with Medvedev's perspective, it is evident that Russia has articulated legitimate reasons for its intervention in Ukraine. 
Despite claims by media outlets such as the New York Times, the Financial Times, and The Economist that the war in Ukraine was unprovoked, serious scholars like John J. Mearsheimer from. The University of Chicago have expressed disagreement. In his 2014 paper, Why the Ukraine Crisis is the West's Fault, the liberal delusions that provoked Putin, Mearsheimer argued, since the mid-1990s, Russian leaders have adamantly opposed NATO enlargement, and in recent years, they have made it clear that they would not stand by while their strategically important neighbor turned into a Western bastion. For Putin, the illegal overthrow of Ukraine's democratically elected and pro-Russian president, which he rightly labeled a coup, was the final straw. He responded by taking Crimea, a peninsula he feared would host a NATO naval base, and working to destabilize Ukraine until it abandoned its efforts to join the West. Mearsheimer posited that the widely held belief among the political and intellectual elite in the West, suggesting that Vladimir Putin sought to revive the Soviet Empire, is categorically false and lacks any basis in factual evidence. Mearsheimer continues to say, The taproot of the trouble is NATO enlargement, the central element of a larger strategy to move Ukraine out of Russia's orbit and integrate it into the West. At the same time, the EU's expansion eastward and the West's backing of the pro-democracy movement in Ukraine, beginning with the Orange Revolution in 2004, were critical elements too. Putin's pushback should have come as no surprise. After all, the West had been moving into Russia's backyard and threatening its core strategic interests, a point Putin made emphatically and repeatedly. The Western elite was well aware that NATO's political maneuvers in Ukraine and Georgia would face widespread rejection from countries across the globe. Carl Gershman, president of the National Endowment for Democracy, declared in the Washington Post in 2013, Ukraine's choice to join Europe will accelerate the demise of the ideology of Russian imperialism that Putin represents. Russians, too, face a choice, and Putin may find himself on the losing end, not just in the near abroad, but within Russia itself. Mearsheimer again writes, The West's triple package of policies, NATO enlargement, EU expansion, and democracy promotion, added fuel to a fire waiting to ignite, the United States does not tolerate distant great powers deploying military forces anywhere in the Western Hemisphere, much less on its borders. Imagine the outrage in Washington if China built an impressive military alliance and tried to include Canada and Mexico in it. Mearsheimer added, Did Cuba have the right to form a military alliance with the Soviet Union during the Cold War? The United States certainly did not think so, and the Russians think the same way about Ukraine joining the West. Mearsheimer sent shockwaves through the political sphere with his 2013 paper, and the Western media, along with its puppet journalists, have yet to forgive him. According to them, it was a mistake for him to write such a paper. Rather than engaging with the arguments Mearsheimer presented, much of the media chose to attack straw men and red herrings, for example, in February of 2023, British journalist and Financial Times columnist Gideon Rackman wrote in the Irish Times, The argument that the U.S. bears responsibility for the war in Ukraine ignores a principle fundamental to both morality and law, that the responsibility for a murder or a murderous invasion lies with the person who pulls the trigger or gives the command. Preventive wars are sometimes regarded as acceptable, but only if a rival nation is poised to strike. Ukraine was obviously not in that position last year. By blurring this point, Mearsheimer does become an unwitting apologist for Putin's war of aggression. This irrational idea lacks credibility, and even if we were to entertain it, Rachman seems unlikely to apply the same principle to the catastrophic consequences of the Iraq war or the ongoing situation in Palestine where Israel is involved in the liquidation of Palestinians, notably during the Gaza War that commenced in October of 2023. Likewise, Mark Rees Oxley of the British newspaper The Guardian Cudis Thomas Rees 
an associate professor at the Swedish National Defense College, emphasizing that NATO's expansion should be a cause for concern for Russia. But Rice ends up saying that, the problem with this argument is that no one in their wildest dreams can imagine the West attacking Russia. The question arises again, why didn't the United States permit the Soviet Union to forge a military alliance with Cuba? Rees is unlikely to provide answers to these questions, as he is well aware that no country would tolerate the kind of manipulative actions that NATO is undertaking near Russian borders. Mearsheimer is not the only scholar expressing the view that a significant portion of the West is responsible for the Ukraine crisis. The late Stephen F. Cohen, affiliated with Princeton University and New York University, reiterated these ideas in his 2019 book, War with Russia. Cohen argued extensively that, despite the media propagating outlandish ideas about Russia, including its economy, Vladimir Putin is committed to combating corruption. Cohen writes, Viewed in human terms, when Putin came to power in 2000, some 75% of Russians were living in poverty. Most had lost even modest legacies of the Soviet era. Their life savings, medical and other social benefits, real wages, pensions, occupations, and for men, life expectancy, which had fallen well below the age of 60. In only a few years, the kleptocrat Putin had mobilized enough wealth to undo and reverse those human catastrophes and put billions of dollars in rainy day funds that buffered the nation in different hard times ahead. We judge this historic achievement as we might, but it is why many Russians still call Putin Vladimir the Savior. Cohen's perspective holds merit. As Putin strengthened his position, he confronted the oligarchs who were exerting control over the economy and engaging in covert activities. Mikhail Khodorkovsky was arrested in October 2003 and charged with fraud and tax evasion. Khodorkovsky was also suspected of having ordered several murders, but there was not enough direct evidence to try him for those cases. Khodorkovsky's partner in crime, Leonid Nevzlin, later fled to Israel. Berezovsky and Gusinsky went into exile, facing prosecution if they ever return to Russia. Putin regained control of stolen enterprises, natural resources, oligarch media, and the associated tax revenues. Many of the criminal oligarchs ended up in jail. Those who escaped Sheriff Putin's justice fled to America, Britain, or Israel. A few other big shots were allowed to hold onto most of their assets provided that they behave themselves. When Putin was re-elected in March of 2004, with a whopping 71% of the vote, he cleaned out most of the hated oligarchs, but his pro-market economic reforms were yielding very positive results. Slowly but surely, Mother Russia was crawling out of the much and mire which the Western globalists had skillfully pushed her into. Once the oligarchs have been stripped from their decadent lives, Russian domestic product, GDP, increased six times, climbing up from the 22nd to the 10th largest in the world. Average wages had increased almost tenfold. The percentage of people living below the poverty line was cut in half. Once totaling 150% of GDP, nearly all foreign debt was paid off. Moscow became home to the fastest-growing group of millionaires. Industry grew substantially as did production, construction, real incomes, credit, and the middle class. In the process, after regaining control from the criminal oligarchs, a fund for oil revenue allowed Russia to pay off all of its old debts. Putin's government remains almost debt-free. Under Putin, Russia has strengthened its position as the K oil and gas supplier to Europe. By taking these measures, Putin places himself in a cosmic battle against Satanists in both Russia and the United States, including elements within the controlled media in the United States. Putin further pushed the envelope by making Alexander Solzhenitsyn's classic Gulag Archipelago mandatory reading for Russian high school students. It is ironic that most students in anti-communist America may never hear of Stalin's atrocities, 
while Russian students will be exposed to this critical part of history. The fact that Putin has made Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago a mandatory reading in high school seems to suggest that Putin is familiar with Solzhenitsyn's 200 Years Together, in which Solzhenitsyn meticulously documents that Jewish revolutionaries were largely responsible for the Bolshevik Revolution. This point has been meticulously documented by E. Michael Jones in his magnum opus The Jewish Revolutionary Spirit and its impact on world history. So, when Putin said that the first Soviet government was largely Jewish, he must have gotten that idea from Solzhenitsyn, who said unapologetically, There are many Jewish authors who to this very day either deny the support of Jews for Bolshevism, or even reject it angrily, or else, the most common case, only speak defensively about it. The matter is well attested, however. These Jewish renegades were for several years leaders at the center of the Bolshevik party, at the heat of the Red Army, Trotsky, of the all-Russian central executive Kamidi Sverdlov, of the two capitals, Zinoviev and Kamenev, of the Comintern, Zinoviev, of the Profintern, Dritzo Lozovsky, and of the Komsomol, Oskar Rivkin, then Lazar Shatskin. In 1918, Trotsky, with the aid of Skliansky and Yakov Sverdlov, created the Red Army. Jewish soldiers were numerous in its ranks. Several units of the Red Army were composed entirely of Jews, as e.g. the brigade commanded by Joseph Foreman. Among the officers of the Red Army, the share of Jews grew in number and importance for many years after the Civil War. In summary, the extensive media narrative about Vladimir Putin is significantly flawed. For instance, consider Hillary Clinton's statement in 2022, where she asserted that Putin has an almost messianic belief in himself and dislikes critics, especially if they are women. It seems that the former Secretary of State may need to reflect on her own actions, as it was Hillary Clinton, not Vladimir Putin, who played a role in the destruction of Libya. It's essential to remember that Libya was a thriving country in North Africa, actively seeking to assist other African nations in economic development. When Gaddafi faced his demise, Clinton made a messianic and diabolical declaration, We came! We saw he died. So, I mean, that is the land of unconfirmed. Yes, yes. we came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> Moreover, Politico magazine declared in 2016 that George Soros donated $8 million to boost Hillary Clinton. Who is Dark Lord Soros? Our country needs us. And we need people like George Soros who is fearless and willing to step up when it counts. So please join me in welcoming George Soros. Soros declares in his book, The Alchemy of Finance. It will come as no surprise to the reader when I admit that I have always harbored an exaggerated view of my self-importance. To put it bluntly, I fancied myself as some kind of god or an economic reformer like Keynes, or, even better, a scientist like Einstein. My sense of reality was strong enough to make me realize that these expectations were excessive, and I kept them hidden as a guilty secret. As I made my way in the world, reality came close enough to my fantasy to allow me to admit my secret at least to myself. I have been fortunate enough to be able to act out some of my fantasies. Soros subsequently deployed a political strategy, which has evidently become a fundamental principle of his political agenda. He began utilizing his economic power to manipulate nations and undermine economic progress. Soros stated, if truth be known, I carried some rather potent messianic fantasies with me from childhood, which I felt I had to control, otherwise they might get me in trouble. When asked about this very issue, Soros responded, It is a sort of disease when you consider yourself some kind of God, the creator of everything, but I feel comfortable about it now since I began to live it out. 
Soros laughably told Robert Slater, the author of an unauthorized biography of Soros, that his potent messianic fantasies had nothing to do with subversive movements, but everything to do with helping humanity. What about funding violent movements, such as Black Lives Matter? Does Soros mean to tell us that he is helping humanity by doing so? Soros continued, I do not accept the rules imposed by others, and in periods of regime change, the normal rules don't apply. That's the crux of it, with the belief that normal rules don't apply. Soros has attempted to manipulate the system at his discretion. He successfully rigged the economic and political systems in Yugoslavia and Russia, and he endeavored to do the same in America and even in Asia. Vladimir Putin expelled Soros from Russia due to the perceived threat he posed. Since then, Soros has harbored resentment towards Putin. In fact, Soros penned an entire article in the British newspaper The Guardian, asserting that Putin is worse than ISIS. Soros admitted in an interview that he is involved in amoral activities, while paradoxically attempting to maintain a sense of morality. He stated, I don't feel guilty because I'm engaged in an amoral activity, which is not meant to have anything to do with guilt. While recognizing that the presence of various ideologies, including Satanism, exists in our surroundings, there is no need to succumb to fear or despair. The ultimate triumph lies not with the adversaries of Logos, but with Logos itself and those who align with its principles. Israel and the United States initially believed victory was within reach when they began supporting Syrian rebels, terrorists, and ISIS diabolically back in 2011. However, as the years unfolded, Logos once again asserted its influence, stunning its adversaries. In a manifestation of Hegel's cunning of reason, Iran and Russia emerged on the political stage, effectively hindering both Israel and the United States in Syria. Consequently, they played a crucial role in rescuing the Syrian government, the very government that had been protecting Christians, Muslims, and other religious minorities in the region. Moreover, when the United States masterminded the coup in Ukraine in 2014 against a democratically elected president, they again thought that victory was at hand. As the late John Pilger put it in The Guardian, Washington's planned seizure of Russia's historic, legitimate warm-water naval base in Crimea failed. The Russians defended themselves, as they have done against every threat and invasion from the West for almost a century. The forces of darkness were undoubtedly caught off guard by this significant blowback. Why? because individuals driven solely by carnal perspectives often lack the insight to perceive the cunning of reason operating in the world. Carnal men are blinded by materialism and scientism, a worldview that asserts nature is the entirety of existence, past, present, and future. It reduces man to nothing more than an amalgamation of chemicals and DNA, dismissing any higher significance. Putin has left an indelible mark on the political landscape, and regardless of one's opinions about him, he has elevated the economic, political, and spiritual dimensions in Russia to new heights. Putin asserted, we need to carry out a rational reconstruction and adapt it to the new realities in the system of international relations. A rational reconstruction should advocate for entities like NATO to adhere to international law and universal principles. This reconstruction should also express the viewpoint that the United States should cease its practice of overthrowing one country after another. For instance, former Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, Victoria Nuland, openly acknowledged that the United States invested $5 billion in supporting a coup in Ukraine in 2014. This intervention led to riots in the streets and the ousting of democratically elected President Viktor Yanukovych. This is not a surprise at all. As the late journalist John Pilger wrote in The Guardian in 2014, since 1945 the U.S. has tried to overthrow more than 50 governments, many of them democratically elected, grossly interfered in elections in 30, 
countries, bombed the civilian populations of 30 countries, used chemical and biological weapons, and attempted to assassinate foreign leaders. In his recent two-hour interview with Tucker Carlson, Putin emphasized two major reasons for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. NATO's expansion near Russian borders, a promise that was broken, and the coup in Ukraine in 2014. Putin said, Why the coup? Why the victims? Why threaten Crimea? Why launch an operation in Donbass? This I do not understand. That is exactly what the miscalculation is. CIA did its job to complete the coup. It was they who started the war in 2014. Our goal is to stop this war. And we did not start this war in 2022. This is an attempt to stop it. Putin again isn't making these things up. Citing again John Pilger of The Guardian in 2014. Like the ruins of Iraq and Afghanistan, Ukraine has been turned into a CIA theme park. Run personally by CIA Director John Brennan in Kiev with dozens of special units, from the CIA and FBI setting up a security structure that oversees savage attacks on those who opposed the February coup. Watch the videos, read the eyewitness reports from the massacre in Odessa this month. Bussed fascist thugs burned the trade union headquarters, killing 41 people trapped inside. Watch the police standing by. A doctor described trying to rescue people, but I was stopped by pro-Ukrainian Nazi radicals. One of them pushed me away rudely, promising that soon me and other Jews of Odessa are going to meet the same fate. What occurred yesterday didn't even take place during the fascist occupation in my town in World War II. I wonder why the whole world is keeping silent. When asked whether Russia has achieved its intended goals in Ukraine, Putin responded negatively, stating that Ukraine still needs to undergo denazification. Putin's assertion challenges the narrative perpetuated by some in the United States and much of the West, as he contends that Ukraine's situation requires denazification. This stance, according to Putin, contradicts the prevailing view among political and Satanists who have consistently condemned Nazism. Yet the same Satanists are supporting neo-Nazis in Ukraine. NBC News, for example, declared that Ukraine's Nazi problem is real, but the same news added that Putin's denazification claim isn't. On a similar note, CNN acknowledged that the Ukraine battalion is known to have neo-Nazi elements, stating, The battalion has a history of neo-Nazi leanings, which have not been entirely eradicated despite its integration into the Ukrainian military. In its peak as an autonomous militia, the Azov Battalion was linked with white supremacists and neo-Nazi ideology, displaying associated insignia. Its notable activity occurred in and around Mariupol in 2014 and 2015. The Independent, a British newspaper, estimated the Azov Battalion's membership at around 12,000, and it was organized by Andriy Beletsky, a white supremacist. Beletsky was accused of robbery and assault in 2011, leading to his imprisonment. However, he was later released by the new government in Ukraine. The newspaper continued to say, Following its victories in Mariupol and Marinka in the summer of 2014, the battalion, known for wearing black fatigues, sporting Nazi tattoos, and going into battle with swastikas drawn on its helmets, was officially absorbed into the Ukrainian National Guard in November of that year, soon becoming a regiment. The group, the newspaper added, fought under an explicitly Nazi symbol, a tilted version of the Wolfsangle, borrowed from the 3rd Reich 2nd SS Panzer Division Das Reich, which the group has insisted is simply an N and an I to stand for. National Idea One Azov leader who just goes by the name Dmitri waxed lyrical about Adolf Hitler as a military leader and believes the Holocaust never happened. The same battalion has faced accusations of committing war crimes, including acts of torture, looting, and unlawful detention. Additionally, there were reports of persecution against Ukraine's LGBTQ communities by this battalion. The Independent said, 
In the present conflict, they have reportedly been ruthless enough to coat their bullets in pig's blood in the hope of causing maximum anguish to any Chechen Muslim soldiers they might happen to shoot, Adri Beletsky said. The historic mission of our nation in this critical moment is to lead the white races of the world in a final crusade for their survival, a crusade against the Semite-led inferior races. It doesn't take a historian to recognize that this statement is not only anti-Semitic but also racist. Unfortunately, these are the individuals that much of the media and certain factions, including Satanists, seem to be supporting. The Jewish Daily Forward reported in the summer of 2023, In its existential struggle against Russian invaders, Ukraine, a pro-Western democracy, has elevated some problematic heroes with fascist origins. And its allies, including Jewish leaders and liberal politicians usually on guard against such forces, have largely downplayed or denied this phenomenon. And the anti-defamation league you, the world's premier anti-Semitism watchdog, has softened its assessment of the group since Russia's invasion. The story doesn't end here. Much of the Azov Battalion can be traced back to the political influence of Stefan Bandera. The Jewish Daily Forward tells us that Bandera was a World War II-era Ukrainian nationalist whose forces killed tens of thousands of Jews and Poles in multiple pogroms. The story now gets very interesting. Who was funding the Azov Battalion? It was Ukrainian Jewish billionaire and Israeli oligarch Ihor Kolomoisky. In an article published in 2014 by Aljaminer entitled Ukraine, Battalion Backed by Jewish Billionaire Sent to Fight Pro-Russian Militias, we read, Among those going into battle from the Ukrainian side are some 500 trained fighters in the self-declared Azov Battalion, backed by Jewish energy magnate and Dnipropetrovsk region governor Igor Kolomoisky, according to Israel's Ma'ariv Daily. Wikipedia has this to say about Kolomoisky, the former president of the United Jewish Community in Ukraine. In 2220, he was indicted in the United States on charges related to large-scale bank fraud. In 2021, the U.S. banned Kolomoisky and his family from entering the country, accusing him of corruption and being a threat to the Ukrainian public's faith in democratic institutions. Zelensky reportedly stripped Kolomoisky of his Ukrainian citizenship in 2022. Later that same year, those of Kolomoisky's assets, deemed to be of strategic value to the state, in light of the Russian invasion, were nationalized. These included Ukraine's largest gasoline companies. In 2023, Kolomoisky was arrested by the Security Service of Ukraine on charges of money laundering and fraud and placed under pretrial arrest. Wikipedia again states, Kolomoisky uses the nickname Benya, an invocation of the infamous Ukrainian and Jewish criminal reprobate Benya Krik, popularly fictionalized in Isaac Babel's Odessa stories. In 2019, the New York Times quoted a professor at a local university describing Kolomoisky as a leech who sucks our blood here and puts it in Switzerland. It should be clear by now that Kolomoisky was destroying the Ukrainian economy and looting the Ukrainian population. This is again from Wikipedia. Legal filings from American prosecutors in 2019 detailed how Kolomoisky used his control of Ukraine's largest retail bank, private bank, to loot staggering sums from Ukrainian depositors and via a series of shell companies and offshore accounts whisked the money out of the country and into the U.S. In 2019, the Southern District of Florida found out that Kolomoisky, among others, obtained numerous properties as part of a $5.5 billion Ponzi scheme as an international conspiracy to launder money embezzled and fraudulently obtained. From private bank, which was nationalized in 2016 to prevent a collapse of Ukraine's equivalent to the United States FDIC, and using private banks' Cypress branch as a washing machine for the stolen loan funds. 
By 2021, the United States Department of State declared that Kolomoisky involved in corrupt acts that undermined rule of law and the Ukrainian public's faith in their government's democratic institutions and public processes, including using his political influence and official power for his personal benefit. It was Kolomoisky himself who accused Vladimir Putin of having a messianic drive to rehabilitate the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union. It was only a matter of time before Kolomoisky became entangled in bribing police officers to carry out his illicit activities. Wikipedia again states, On the 3rd of June 2014, Kolomoisky offered a $500,000 reward for the delivery of Oleg, Tsaryov, a leader of the separatists, to the law enforcement agencies of Ukraine. He drafted thousands of private group employees as auxiliary police officers. Kolomoisky is also believed to have spent $10 million to create the Dnipro Battalion and to have provided funds for the IDAR, Azov, and Donbass Volunteer Battalions. Kolomoisky possessed a 70% stake in the One Plus One Media Group, one of Ukraine's largest media conglomerates. Zelensky gained popularity through a comedy series aired on One Plus One, Media Group, portraying a schoolteacher. Dual citizenship is forbidden in Ukraine, but Kolomoisky, along with two other Jewish oligarchs named Vadim Rabinovich and Hennedy Korban, held Israeli passports. In short, the issue is not as black and white as the media would like us to believe. It is much more complicated and far more diabolical than we might imagine. Consider this scenario. If the Russian army harbored a neo-Nazi cell within its ranks, the condemnation from the entire Western world would be swift and justified. The Jewish communities in both America and Israel would likely express strong opposition with calls for accountability. Now, in the case of Ukraine, where neo-Nazis have infiltrated the army, it appears that certain segments of the Zionist and Jewish media face a challenging task of reconciling support for a faction associated with anti-Semitism. The Jewish Daily Forward came out with an article with the subtitle, Some Jewish Leaders have pulled back their criticism of the Azov Brigade since Russia's invasion. In essence, the term anti-Semitism appears to be undermined when neo-Nazis align with Zionist ideology, suggesting a paradoxical acceptance. The irony deepens as Volodymyr Zelensky, often identified as a Jew who lost family members in the Holocaust, is seemingly endorsing neo-Nazis. This raises questions about the consistency of such alliances and the narratives surrounding them. Decent people are rising up against the diabolical system that Satanists have created chaos, not only in the United States, but also in Ukraine and the Middle East. Tucker Carlson's recent interview with Vladimir Putin suggests that the Satanic Empire in the United States and Ukraine is in decline. Putin, as usual, engaged with Carlson's perplexing questions and challenges by offering moral, political, and historical insights. These insights undoubtedly resonated with millions of viewers worldwide. The entire interview was unscripted, showcasing Putin's intellectual prowess as he addressed Carlson's numerous questions, emphasizing his role as a serious politician. Even before the interview, a sense of panic swept through parts of the political landscape. Hillary Clinton swiftly labeled Carlson as a useful idiot. Immediately following the interview, CNN released an article titled Putin Walks Away with Propaganda Victory after Tucker Carlson's softball interview. Likewise, Newsweek reported that the European Union was considering implementing a travel ban on Carlson. Former Estonian Foreign Minister Urmas Payet asserted, Carlson wants to give a platform to someone accused of crimes of genocide. This is wrong. Propaganda for a criminal regime could lead to sanctions, including a travel ban to EU countries. 
In a piece titled The Big Problem with Tucker Carlson's Hyped Putin Interview, the Washington Post argued that Putin's historical perspective on Russia and Ukraine, dating back to the 800s, was problematic. However, this alleged problem may stem from the Washington Post's lack of interest in the authentic history of the two countries. Contrary to the notion that Putin was evading Carlson's questions, he actually took the time to provide insight into the reasons behind his actions in Ukraine. It presented an opportune moment for Putin to integrate historical perspectives into the political discourse. For Putin, being a Christian, the interconnectedness of an individual with history, especially when it holds a purpose, is significant. Similarly, a nation cannot detach itself from its historical context. Notably, in the United States there appears to be a deficiency of historical understanding across all levels of our education system. In May 2015, the esteemed magazine Smithsonian published an article titled How Much U.S. History Do Americans Actually Know Less Than You Think? The article states in part, Last year, Polytech, a student group at Texas Tech University, went around campus and asked three questions. Who won the Civil War? Who is our vice president? And who did we gain our independence from? Students' answers ranged from the South, for the first question to, I have no idea, for all three of them. However, when asked about the show Snooky starred in Jersey Shore or Brad Pitt's marriage history, they answered correctly. This lack of knowledge in American history is not limited to college students. Studies over the years show Americans of all ages fail to answer the most simple of questions. A 2008 study by the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, which surveyed more than 2,500. Americans found that only half of adults in the country could name the three branches of government. The 2014 National Assessment of Educational Progress, NAEP, report found that only 18% of 8th graders were proficient or above in U.S. history and only 23% in civics. In 2011, National Public Radio asserted that students have never known history in America, a sentiment echoed by the Council on Foreign Relations, Forbes magazine, and U.S. News and World Report in 2019, 2020, and 2023, respectively. Given these concerns, Putin's emphasis on the historical dimension during the interview served a legitimate purpose dispelling the notion that he is an eccentric dictator from space attempting to revive the Soviet Union, a narrative perpetuated relentlessly by the American media. However, news outlets like the Washington Post, determined to maintain control over their audience, feel compelled to provide explanations for why the interview was considered problematic from start to finish. The intriguing aspect here is the European Union's attempt to impose a travel ban on Carlson, all while proudly asserting their commitment to spreading democracy and freedom worldwide. Carlson's alleged transgression? Conducting an interview with Putin. One doesn't need to be a logician to discern the evident contradiction in this situation. The lingering question is whether as individuals blessed with Intel ESCT and the capacity for reason, we possess the courage to abstain from participating in a categorical lie. If Alexander Solzhenitsyn's assertion that one word of truth outweighs the world holds true, then when Putin made the decision that he and his country would not be deceived by NATO, Ukraine, or the United States, he stood against the satanic forces that have ensnared both nations. Putin has held admiration for Solzhenitsyn throughout a significant portion of his political career. Over the years, a considerable portion of social media has propagated the misleading claim that Alexander Dugin is Putin's brain, a categorical lie. Surprisingly, many media outlets express admiration for Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn made some uncomfortable remarks about the Bolshevik Revolution, highlighting the predominant role of Jewish revolutionaries in bringing it about. In his 1978 address at Harvard University, he asserted that, Truth is seldom sweet, it is invariably bitter. 
He went on to express his concern about a noticeable decline in courage in the West, particularly among the ruling and intellectual elites. According to Solzhenitsyn, this decline in courage gradually led to a lack of manhood, fostering a culture of cowardice. He argued that, as a result, mediocrity prevails under the guise of democratic restraints. Solzhenitsyn then proceeded to drop a political bomb. Society has turned out to have scarce defense against the abyss of human decadence, for example against the misuse of liberty for moral violence against young people, such as motion pictures full of pornography, crime, and horror. This is all considered to be part of freedom and to be counterbalanced, in theory, by the young people's right not to look and not to accept. Life organized legalistically has thus shown its inability to defend itself against the corrosion of evil. Solzhenitsyn called this kind of decadence the psychic diseases of the 20th century and more than anywhere else this is manifested in the press. In-depth analysis of a problem is anathema to the press. It is contrary to its nature. As an alternative to Western decadence and corruption, Solzhenitsyn advocated for a spiritual blaze which should engender a new height of vision, a new level of life wherein existence embodies eternal values. In this realm, our spiritual essence would not be subjected to the disregard prevalent in the modern era. The ascent resembles climbing onto the next anthropological stage. Solzhenitsyn emphasized that no one on earth has any other recourse but to move upward. Elsewhere, Solzhenitsyn put the issue into proper perspective by bringing in the moral dimension. The goal of human evolution is not freedom for the sake of freedom, nor is it the building of an ideal polity. What matter, of course, are the moral foundations of society. In simpler terms, if morality is deemed non-existent, individuals are reduced to mere subjects, instruments, or machines that can be programmed or reprogrammed. The absence of morality brings us back to enlightenment and materialistic ideology echoing. The idea that, as expressed by La Metri, man is nothing more than a machine. Additionally, before his death, Solzhenitsyn praised Vladimir Putin for the work he was undertaking. This endorsement came as a complete surprise to the intellectual elite in the West. Peter Eltsov of the National Defense University disparagingly declared, Indeed, it is one of history's ironies that the number one internal enemy of the Soviet Union has now become a spiritual guru to a former KGB officer who repeatedly voices nostalgia for Soviet times. Solzhenitsyn said of Putin, Putin inherited a ransacked and bewildered country with a poor and demoralized people, and he started to do what was possible, a slow and gradual restoration. These efforts were not noticed nor appreciated immediately. In any case, one is hard-pressed to find examples in history when steps by one country to restore its strength were met favorably by other governments. U.S. Ambassador William Burns, who visited Solzhenitsyn four months before he died at the age of 90, said that, under Putin, the nation was rediscovering what it was to be Russian, Solzhenitsyn thought. Putin said of Solzhenitsyn, the most important thing is that Solzhenitsyn's voice continues to ring out, that his thoughts and ideas resound in people's hearts and minds. Putin serves as an example that a single word of truth can outweigh the world. The teachings of Solzhenitsyn and Putin emphasize that the West must return to its roots, embracing Logos, the essence and creator of the rational universe, to confront the moral and spiritual challenges that lie ahead. Logos, the force that shaped both you and me, guides us to be rational individuals by aligning with our destiny, following and pursuing the truth and wholeheartedly embracing it. Do we have the courage to follow the truth, regardless of where it leads? Truth, even when it appears awkward, uninteresting, or threatening, stands as humanity's sole defense against spiritual, moral, and intellectual insanity. Let this be our unwavering stance toward truth as we navigate through these challenging times.
Thank you.